2023 agenda setting meeting for the Willow Hill School District. Ms. Collins, please call the roll. Mrs. Lawson? Here. Mr. Belmont? Here. Ms. Reed? Here. Mr. Robert Clinigan Bay? Here. Dr. McMillan? Here. Mr. Rensland? Here. Mrs. Arthrell? Here. Mrs. Lyons? Here. Mr. Carlton Scott? Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, one four. We will be asking for acceptance of the October agenda meeting minutes. We'll tap one five. We will be asking for acceptance of the October legislative meeting minutes. Uh, the board met in executive session uh, uh, be before the meeting, and it was uh, strictly about personnel issues. Student represent. Hi, I'm Bree Boyd. I'm a senior at the high school and I'm your student board representative. Um, we This month, we have two powder puff games. We have a football game, which will be happening this Tuesday at 7.30. It'll feature the girls playing flag football and we have boy cheerleaders. And then we also have a powder puff volleyball game where the boys will be playing volleyball against each other. We have two very competitive teams. That'll be happening sometimes before Thanksgiving break. Um, our band won states, so that's a big thing. Annabelle Johnson also went to states for cross country. Cross country. Yeah. Kindness Day is Monday, where students will be around the district spreading different acts of kindness. Our performing arts show is only a month away. Junior High Musical Annie is two months ago, two months away, and BSU has held their first few events. Our first event was painting with BSU, which was a very big success. And November seventeenth, winter sports will officially have their first practice. On Halloween, the preschool kids went around the building in costumes and trick or treated to any classroom that wanted them to. We also had a Halloween door decorating contest where Miss Anaya's class won. They watched Boo and had popcorn and drinks as a reward last Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to add only because I'm involved. Mr. McGuire is having the readathon at the library on the 22nd of November. Thank you. For students and Teachers bring the kids in just to hear reading, books being read. What was the day? Uh, 22nd of November, the day before the Thanksgiving break. Some of us, we've been invited to read. Any of us can go read, actually. Announcements? Okay, we have two announcements. The first one is changing. So the initial announcement is the EOS date change to November 28th, where it was going to be re-energizing the Mon Valley session. Um, together with the high school, there's locally elected officials and obviously the representatives from EOS, also some people from the federal government. They called me today and asked to reschedule this into later in December because they don't want to make it a listening session and a talking session. They want to make it an action session. So they are at the phase in the game now where the federal government and the Clean Energy Act is starting to put money behind their initiative. And so they hired on seven new people, executive level people, that are now gonna be in charge of turning this talk into action. One of the things Mr. Wilson is gonna talk about today is what this means to our students and this workforce development pathway they are creating. I mean, this is a huge, this EOS plan in Turtle Creek is a huge endeavor, um, close to what Amazon was going to provide to our community. Um, they are hiring a thousand jobs in the next six months, local jobs in our area, and they want a pathway for our students to be employed there coming out of graduation. So it builds perfectly for what we're doing with our computer science program. I'm not taking your presentation, Eddie. Um, but again, there, there will be another date change for that, but it's a date change for a good reason. Um, second, Mr. Carr, will you come up, please? Come up to the microphone for one sec. And members of the band, please come on forward. Mr. Carp, before I begin, why don't you introduce who you have with you today? I'd love to. Um, so 
With me today from the staff standpoint, we have Mr. Varga, who is a teacher at Dixon and the assistant marching band director, and Mrs. Powers, whose son just graduated last year. Um, and she is our uniform coordinator, decided to stick around after her son left, which we are very grateful for. Um, and then more importantly, no offense, um, <laughs> we have some of our student leadership. So we have Ms. Gretchen Van Dusen, our drum major, Mr. Liam Blaney, our drum major, and Ms. Sarah McCune, one of our woodwind captains. Um, and they were the ones that were able to be here tonight, but it's, there's a lot more from the leadership standpoint, um, a lot more students that deserve some recognition for their hard work this year, but this is who we got. <laughs> Yay. Yay. So on behalf of the board and the administration, we want to congratulate you all, uh, for becoming the tournament of bands group 4A state champions. Uh, the band finished with their highest score of 82.9. I got that from Mr. Carr, and the students did an excellent job. Um, more importantly, you know, Mr. Carr, we're getting to watch you on the sidelines at halftime every week. Uh, the passion you bring, you're performing with those kids in your mind. You're you're moving with them, you're dancing with them, you're into it every week. Um, and so it just says a lot about the, the, the passion you bring to our students. Uh, the increase in numbers that you had last year, we challenged you. And said, we need to grow this band. You went from, what, 60 to what? 107. 107. In one year. That's amazing. It's an amazing result. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for your work. Thank you for everything that you guys did. And congratulations. Please accept this on behalf of all of us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Good job. I'll finish up. Presentations. Can I chime in with one yeah. um one one upcoming upcoming um event? We also were invited as um a community and a board to shop with a cop by the um Edgewood Police. They have teamed with uh, Giant Eagle and they have um, some of our elementary students from Woodland Hills as well as WPSD, you know, Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. And on November 18th at 9.30 at Target in the waterfront, they will be outfitting, you know, our kids, giving out refreshments, all that good jazz. So we've been invited as a community and a board. Just wanted to share that. Okay, presentations. Do you want to Miss Paulette? Yeah, Paulette Foster, okay. 412 Justice. Yes. Hey, how's everyone? Good. You know what the second part about this? I lost my notes. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that means I'm supposed to speak from what I know. Good afternoon. Well, good evening. My name is Miss Paulette Foster. I am a special education organizer with 412 Justice. I am here to share with you. It's time to get on the bus. Yes. We are heading to Harrisburg, November the 14th, and we are asked, and we have already spoke to Dr. Costanza and Karen Lyons to be a part of this bus ride. What is this bus ride? It's an opportunity for our students, for our parents, for our, um, the, our marginalized uh, community whose voices are never heard. There is a statement that I heard many times before. It's good to be at the table because if you're not, you're going to be on the menu. All right. The other statement is there's nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. So as we move on this date, November the 14th, we are going there to be a part of the Basic Education Funding Commission. Uh, it's a rally lobby day. And what's happening at that time, we are partnering with PA Schools Works. And we're in coalition with them as an organization. The focus is to be a rally and lobby day. 2011, the previous governor, Corbett, gutted $1 billion from education. That money has not been resurfaced and that money has not been placed into the budget. What was founded in 2014, there were individuals who actually fought, filed a suit against the state of Pennsylvania education for money not being available in, the, in our country, in our state. So what happens is the low wealth um, districts are not receiving enough funding. And the courts have found that it is up to the PA district 
uh, Department of Education to make this money available. So we are partnering with you and some of our marginalized individuals to have that voice heard. What does the organizer offer in, in regards to when we organize? We help our individuals to learn how to speak at public hearings such as these, how to communicate to legislature, legislators to also have the opportunity to say, you know what, these are our tax dollars. And we are coming to talk to our state representatives and our senators. We are giving our students the opportunity to be a part of this adventure. We're gonna leave here, but with the um, graciousness of Dr. Costanza to give us the space here to take at least three buses up to Harrisburg. I'm sharing this information so you're aware of what's taking place. Because as long as we sit back and allow legislators to dictate what we get in funding, then we suffer a great loss. We know that in, in the court hearing, they were founded that the education law, the education that students should be re to receive in these low wealth districts are not getting the necessary funding and the necessary services. English learners are not getting taught. The resources not being brought to the table, to their schools. There are not enough sufficient teachers. There's no math and um, reading specialists offered. Social workers, counselors, the basic education that is constitutionally supposed to be given to our students. So I wanted to bring this information to you all so you know where your teachers, your students, administrators are going with us on November the 14th. If you have any other conversation that you wanna know about this, feel free to reach out to uh, Karen Lyons. She's part of us in regards to this fight. And again, there's nothing about us without us. And if you don't show up to the table, you will be on the menu. Thank you. <laughs> I wanna thank uh, Doc for permitting us to work with these other school districts because as a fellow also with the education voters of Pennsylvania, I've learned so much about how we have failed as a state to fund our schools, how private privatizing schools, charter schools are taking money. We've talked about this numerous amount of times. So this is an opportunity for the students to speak. We're gonna have the student speakers. We, again, as Ms. Paula stated, we partner with um, teachers and advocates on the east side of Pennsylvania so that we can have our voices heard on the state capital steps, and then we're going to visit the lawmakers. And we're gonna shout out to Governor Shapiro because he's still teetering on vouchers and we can't have that, so, right? Right. So, thank you, thank you, Ms. Paulette. Yeah. And the board approved this trip um, last month. Um, we are sending 52 students, I believe was the count today, uh, to leave Tuesday morning to go to Harrisburg. Clareton is sending students, McKeesport is sending students, and Penn Hills is sending students. So it's twofold for us. Number one, one of our goals this year was to engage with our community partnerships. But number two, we want our students with students from other schools because they, we need to learn to advocate together. And they're also going to interact with other kids in other schools and outside settings. So it's another opportunity for us to get our kids together and for our legislators to see who their laws impact in their face on those capital steps again. So proud of our students for stepping up. Uh, Menavala group asked one day, 50, 52 students signed up. So that just shows you uh, that their commitment to engagement with our kids. So excited. Just so, just so you know, I do live in the borough of Scale for Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, school photos, Kimberly Gardner. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to I'm just going to say, I'm just going to i well, first and foremost, um, my name is Kimberly. I am a parent of the Woodland Hill School District. I've been in the district for 20 years, um, which I'm excited about. I love Woodland Hills. My oldest daughter, you know, she's 19. She didn't get a chance to graduate from Woodland Hills, but she went to Woodland Hills from kindergarten to 11th grade. I have two daughters who are currently in Dixon um, Middle School right now. Ms. Klein, you know, people who are in this room made a big difference for my children. But the reason why I'm here is I am a photographer. 
and I'm a marketing consultant. So I have a photography proposal for the Wilton Hill School District for Dixon Middle School. Um, how this came about was I emailed Mr. Howe, who I love dearly, <laughs> um, you know, when's school picture day for Dixon? You know, I'm always looking at the calendar, trying to figure out what's going on for the children. And he said, you know what, we don't have a date set yet. So I took that as an opportunity um, to present to the board to possibly take pictures for the Dixon Middle School. Okay, so we can go to the next slide if that's okay. Um, just a little bit of an introduction about myself. My name is Kimberly Gartner. I am the CEO of Kimberly's Marketing Firm, LLC. So I have my own business. Um, a little bit more history about me. So, you know, just in general, um, I've been in the healthcare field for about 20 years. I'm a recruiting manager right now. Um, I do have my executive master's degree in business administration. Um, I'm a recruiting manager, so that's my nine to five. But my passion is marketing, photography, film production, right? Um, so I have a passion for photography. I would love to have the opportunity to create beautiful, cost-effective school pictures along with the yearbook for Dixon. Um, so we can move to the next slide. <laughs> oh, I can click it. Which one? This one? Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's my picture. That's me. Uh, <laughs> once again, I already mentioned who I, who I am. I've also worked with children for 17 years. Um, I was a youth director as well. Um, so I'm going to go over to the next slide here. So my objective was to just also, you know, just go forth with my passion and see if I, this proposal can be approved. But I would like to create cost-effective photos and lasting memories for the families and students and the staff of Dixon Middle School. I know when I used to go to school, your books were amazing. You know, eighth grade, going into the high school, high school, graduating, going to college, the autographs, the t-shirts, you know, looking at our teachers from you know, 2003, like, wow, that was my teacher. Um, I look at it more as something that the children will love and look back at like, wow, look how I used to look in sixth or seventh grade, right? Um, it gives us lasting memories, you know, photos are history. Our children are constantly on social media. Um, but just to have those pictures in a yearbook, I believe will be amazing. Um, and just a vision looking forward. My second objective, um, for that was the yearbook, um, which I'm really excited about if this was to happen. Um, because in a yearbook, you know, Dixon never had a yearbook. I don't think my daughter, I never bought one. It was too much, you know, at the high school. So when I vision the yearbook for Dixon, I can see the band. I can see the football team. I can see the board. I can see the principal, you know, just looking back at those pictures, I'm pretty sure you all remember your yearbooks or probably still have them in your house right now. So why not create that opportunity for our children, right? Um, biggest thing for me is it's cost effective. We know the economy has changed a lot for parents and family members uh, to be able to pay for these pictures at a decent price, right? Um, the project goals that I had the first goal would be to provide the district with dates prior to the calendar, 2024, 2025 school year. Um, you'll have your picture day. I know as a mom, as a parent, my children love to know when their picture day is. We want to pick out those picture day outfits because it's the only time they get to wear regular clothes. You know, so to have that date <laughs> prepared at the beginning of the school year because it helps us as parents as well. Um, and my second goal, which I love to do is, you know, I would love to coordinate with the school district to have those dates set aside for group pictures. You know, I'll go out to the football team, take that um, football shot, you know, so it can go in the yearbook. Those things are really important. The band choir, the PTA. These are just my ideas. <laughs> Um, I also provide quality service. So my firm, I will be using professional equipment, which consists of my Canon camera, backdrop lights, and more, right? The full team that I have, they will all have their clearances if this proposal is approved for next year. Um, I will have all of that information. My website will be completed and given to the board for review in January of 2024. Um, the families of the district, they can order directly online 
once again, cost effective affordable prices. I will also have additional merchandise that you can buy as far as like putting your child's picture on a cup, on a mug, on a t-shirt, you know, magnets and more. But most important, uh, the yearbooks right before the school's about school year is about to be over so they can go around and get those signatures and the yearbook will be very cost effective. Um, next slide, these are my daughters. But that is a professional picture Not that I took. So <laughs> thank you. you um, thank you so much. That's Kamara and that's Catalina. They both go to Dixon. They're in sixth and seventh grade. They love it. Um, but that's one of the pictures that I took of them just to kind of show you a little bit of my work. That's my youngest daughter, Catalina. When I took this picture, I wasn't thinking about school pictures. I took this about three years ago. But when I looked at my pictures, I said, this is beautiful because it shows her smile, you know, um, even with all of her children in the district. And I know how to make them post and laugh. So when they take that picture, we're going to get a smile. <laughs> um, so just the last few slides, you know, I just have these pinpoints up here, you know, brilliant ideas, creative ideas, best ideas, awesome ideas. These students have cool ideas. And I know at Dixon, they do so much there. My girls come home and they're so excited about the programs they're in. If it was a possibility, I wouldn't mind helping with the yearbook committee where they have those ideas. I remember Hunt coming king and queen in the yearbook, prettiest eyes, class clown, best teacher, funniest teacher, just last longing memories, long memories. So in conclusion, um, once again, it's cost effective. Um, like I said before, you know, some parents can't even afford to put food in their refrigerators right now because of the economy. I want them to be able to have their children ready for picture day and be able to afford these pictures for their students. Um, the cost of the packages in a yearbook will be provided to the board members for review. Um, I will be beating the prices of my competitors of the district, so they will be a cheaper cost. Um, and I will also sponsor 10 families for free eight by 10 um, pictures upon the board's approval. Um, and then just in conclusion of that, in those folders, you will find my bio, my flyer, and on the last page, you'll see the cost um, for the board to review for approval. So I appreciate your time and thank you for the opportunity. I'm never usually nervous, but I told my sister, I'm, I think I'm nervous. But I'm <laughs> But I just thank you all for taking the time to hear me today. And hopefully you'll use Kimberly's marketing firm for your pictures for Dixon Middle School next year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Kim. Any questions? Eddie Wilson. Right. That's good people. I just want to name that I'm excited to work from this Paul. That sounds like good stuff. That sounds like really good stuff. Uh, also, before I start my presentation, I do want to make a public announcement. The last time I presented to you, I presented data on enrollment, and I got a, an email from a parent that said the state says that you actually had a bump, uh, and I had said that we hadn't had a bump in enrollment since 2012. In reality, we did have a bump in our enrollment numbers reported to the state right after we had a virtual COVID year. We believe that that bump was because we had withdrawn so many kids because we were virtual. Um, and they weren't online, and then they came back. Uh, but he, the parent corrected me that I, I can't say that for sure. So I want to make that caveat. This is the first year that we believe we've had a legitimate bump since 2012 in enrollment in the district. So I want to want to make sure that I name that because I want to be fair in terms of the depth. With that, though, the district is getting noticed, and we are excited to tell you about some of the things that we've been invited to recently. If you've sent me an email in the last two weeks, you've gotten it out of office, and I am happy about that. We've been doing some great things. I want to tell you about those things. Uh, but I want to start, we were actually, uh, Mr. Johnson and I were at a meeting in Bowie State, Maryland, where uh, one of the panelists that I was with talked about that they start every meeting reviewing the vision and the mission of the district. So for the first slide tonight, I want to just name that our vision is for all students to be empowered to embrace learning and to own their future with the confidence to find their passion. Uh, and then our mission is that the core purpose of our district is to establish one community of learning that creates new opportunities while sustaining established successful programming for students through relationships, relevance, and rigor 
one student at a time. I feel like it's important for us to revisit that sometimes. Also, before I tell you about conferences and summits, it would not be an Eddie Wilson presentation if it did not have a little bit of data. PVOS data was released last week. And for those that don't know what PVOS data is, that's Pennsylvania Value Added Assessment System. Ms. Arthrell knows all about it because she was always in the blue. PVOS data is what we have uh, that truly connects teacher to student in terms of state growth. So it's it's this data is not all 330 of our teachers. This data is 70 of our teachers. It's the 70 teachers that teach a course that is specifically tested by either PSSAs or Keystones. And PVOS says, if Mr. Wilson taught Mr. Scott math in fifth grade, and then Mr. Scott took the PSSA, we can tell how well Mr. Wilson did based on that. And so I wanted to share the data because it looks really good. And the work that we're doing is really good. So this is math. This is our math PVOS. From last year's PSSAs, you can see that fourth through eighth grade all either met, were above, or were well above the expected growth from, from PDE. And again, I think it's important for us to look at PVOS because this is not Eddie Wilson's data. This is not map data that Eddie Wilson brought in. This is what the state gives us, and this is what the state looks at when they talk about the effectiveness of our educators. This one... Ooh, can we, Mr. Kim, could you move the view screen over to the left just so the folks can see the, sorry. So this is, I, I chose for ELA to compare 2022 to 2023 because the difference is so stark. 2022, you can see in ELA, all five grades, fourth through eighth grade, were well below growth expected from the state. And in 2023, last year, our PSSAs, Fifth through eighth grade were all either met or above or well above. And across all grades, we were well above the expected growth. That's awesome. And that and, and, and that goes back to those reading scores you had at Dixon that were so great last year. Exactly right. That's exactly right, Ms. Arthur, for sure. And then again, because I, I always want to take us back to uh, racial equity and to our goals around racial equity, and our students of color and whether or not they're succeeding at the same or greater growth rate as our white students. I broke, I broke the data down. The district has a great dashboard. Anybody wants to talk about the dashboard, come and look with the, the dashboard with me. Across all grade bands in ELA, PSSA, our African-American students were well above the expected growth. Across all grade bands in math on PSSA, our African-American students were well above the expected growth. And on our algebra keystone, the, all of our African-American students met the expected growth within one standard deviation. So again, we're making sure that our scholars are growing and we're making sure that we're closing the racial achievement gaps that we've historically seen. I'm just really proud of the work that we're doing. And this is the last slide that I'll show you about data. I know that some people get, get glazed eyes after four or five slides of data. This is... The comparison of school districts locally and the growth. So I took Elizabeth Ford School District, Fox Chapel School District, Life Mail Steam Academy, Penn Hills, Propel Charter Schools, West Mifflin, Wilkinsburg, and Woodland Hills, and I compare them. The y-axis is growth. The x-axis is basic achievement, is, is value achievement. Um, standardized achievement. So where you want to be is above the middle line. The blue stars are Woodland Hills. And I will point out to you that of the 19 schools on this graph, from Elizabeth Ford, from Fox Chapel, from Penn Hills, from Propel, the highest growing school is Dixon Middle School. Yes. The highest growing school is Dixon Middle School. The second highest growing school is Wilkins Elementary School. The fourth highest growing school is Edgewood Elementary School. And the sixth highest growing school is Turtle Creek Elementary School. Our schools are outperforming schools regardless of affluence, SES, demographics. Our schools are outperforming. And I, I believe personally that it's because of the hard work that we're putting in and the expectations that we have for our teachers, our administrators, our scholars, our families, and ourselves. I'm very proud. I wanna just reiterate 
Anybody that wants to look at this data, uh, we could meet at Drew's at 8 a.m. and we could do this for hours and hours. It's really, really cool information. And I love to tell you about it. The last thing I'll do regarding the data is that I want to read out loud in a recorded statement, the names of the 16 educators that far exceeded the growth projections from the state. These are people that don't get a lot of recognition. So Jamie Backo Pfeiffer, Molly Boswell, Greg Carpenter, Bill Coles, Joyce Gratton, Lauren Gross, Emily Hall, Tracy Mitchell, Sarah Vollmer, Allison Bortz, Melissa Broadwater, Alexander Gow, Joyce Gratton, Mirabai Kasecki, Michael Kravansky, and Jacob Kupitzer. These are all individual educators that were well above exceeded growth or expected growth from the state. And I think they deserve to be shouted out. I'll name two, I'll put it at the bottom of the slide, but last year we only had five educators. We tripled that measure this year, which is pretty awesome. All right, now I'll move on to what, I've been, what I was actually asked to talk about, which is the places that we've been over the last couple of weeks. So we were asked in the past month, we were asked to speak in two specific places. We were asked to speak at the CS for All conference in Oakland, California. That's the trip that you approved for Dr. Castagna, myself, and Ms. Dietrich to go on. And we were asked to come present on a panel and then at breakout sessions at the Environmental Literacy Summit at Bowie State University in Maryland. At the CS for All Summit, I sat on a panel with some of the smartest people I've ever met. So uh, the guy on the left is, is a representative from CS for All. He was facilitating the conference. Kate Maloney, the lady next to him, though, is the executive director for the largest IT company in the world. She's the executive director of their foundational wing. She gives out lots and lots and lots of money across, across the US. Next to her is Kalisha Davis. That's the director of the KPOR Center in Detroit. KPOR Center has two places, Detroit and Oakland. They fund top quality programming across the nation. And then Paul Schoenfeld is in charge of all computer science learning from districts, he works at the University of Minnesota across all of the state of Minnesota. And then there's little old me. And it was pretty awesome to be invited to go speak on that. And I will add that we led that conversation. We absolutely led that conversation because we were the only district there that was committed to see us for all. Pre-K to 12, we were committed to see us for all. And there were other districts that were doing it with other platforms and in pilots and in different pockets and different ways. And there were great ideas. We got lots of great ideas. We were the only one that said every kid and that, that we will do something with that. So it was really, really cool to do that. And then the last thing that I'll mention about the CS for All Summit is that we heard that we're ahead of the curve. Everybody we talked to said we're, we are ahead of the curve. There's actually research that's coming out for those that like to read peer-reviewed research that gets published and is in dissertation form. There are researchers from UT Austin right now putting together a dissertation on a survey of a thousand educators from across the US. And they said that the biggest thing that teachers who want to teach computer science lack, the biggest things are time, a scope and sequence, buy-in from central office administration, resources like robots and Chromebooks, collaborative opportunities to talk to one another, and dedicated staffing like Ms. Dietrich and Mr. Bothwell. When I told the researchers that we had all of that and that we were trying to eliminate barriers for our educators, these people that just interviewed a thousand instructors from across the US said that they hadn't heard of any districts that, that were doing that, that were breaking down those barriers. So again, I just wanna shout out the, the level of work that we're doing with computer science, pre-K to 12, through the VEX platform is ahead of the curve in terms of people that know what's ahead of the curve. I didn't even know what the curve was until two years ago. And now I know the curve and we're ahead of it. And then the Environmental Literacy Summit, Mr. Belmont actually championed before I got here, the present, uh, the climate action resolution. For anybody that's new to the board, I'd like to name to you that we were the first district in the state of Pennsylvania to uh, pass a climate action resolution. We were the first district in the state of Pennsylvania to have a climate action team and a climate action plan. And we were the only district at the climate action summit uh, from Pennsylvania. We were the only district from Pennsylvania that was invited there. 
I sat on a panel with folks from Prince William County, Lynchburg City Schools, Baltimore County Public Schools. Two of those are the largest districts in their state, by the way, and then me. They can't spell Wilson correctly, but we'll forgive them that. Mr. Johnson and I, because it was a relatively local trip and because we wanted to save the district uh, cost of a hotel, we drove down at 6 a.m. We drove back at 10 p.m. Uh, so that we could be there for the day and sit on this panel. He led a breakout session and I sat on the panel in front of the, the whole crew. Now, just those are just some fun pictures from when we were on the panel with these really, really cool people, really smart people that are thinking about the ways that we can incorporate climate action into everything that we do. So through those two summits, through those, those places that we went, we've been asked to apply for several grants based on the presentations we did. I wrote down just a handful of them. We were asked to apply for a KPOR grant, an RK Mellon grant, an Infosys Foundation grant, a Future 40 grant, a NOAA grant, and then a Department of Energy grant. Um, all just from those conferences, at those conferences, not that we went and sought out, not that we like looked up, oh, hey, we could get some money here. People sought us out to say, I have a grant and I think that you should apply. So the, this idea that we're getting acknowledgement also comes with perks of being able to fund what we're doing for longer term. So I'm really excited about that. And then we've identified, clearly we've identified several new partners uh, with whom we can collaborate, just people all over the nation that are thinking about computer science and climate action in new ways in the K-12 education space. And it's really cool to do that. So thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity to just present that to you. I wanted to show off our district a little bit. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, Doug. Joe Regan, the annual financial report. Thank you. Well, we'll see. Huh? Um, as promised, I uh, mentioned, I don't know, a month or so ago that when the annual financial report was sent to the state that I would come and present the findings to you. So this is just a small um, version of what the annual financial report looks like. The auditor is still working. We have, she did tell me though, that we have, um, she has not found anything that is material. She's doing a few different um, journal entries that she always does every year and hopefully she'll be done by Christmas. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring that to you then. But I thought I would take the opportunity to tell you about the annual financial report, which is the end of the 22-23 school year. So these are our local revenues. You'll see that the anticipated revenue was um, $60.7 million. We did have a few adjustments as the year went on. The 6,900s where the adjustments were, those are local funds. Those adjustments usually come in the form of different grants or different opportunities that people bring us. And then the um, my office makes the adjustment and the revenue goes up. Therefore, um, it was increased by almost $80,000. You can see that the actual year-to-date revenue received was $61,541,422.27, which is actually $738,715 above the budget. I know that when you pull this out of our system, it usually looks like a negative is a bad thing, but a negative and revenue is a good thing. So to accountants, they get that. So Kelly and I understand that. But so this is a good thing, actually. The local revenues came in higher than we had anticipated. A large portion of that was the um, earnings on investments. We actually made almost a million dollars in investing our funds. Um, Kelly and I worked diligently to make sure that Pease Laugh and Pliggett and PNC use the funding instead of just sitting in a checking account and making no money we we put it in cds tr uh, treasury bonds different things like that and as soon as the money comes in she actually found the money that we need to pay to pay the bills and the rest of it is invested throughout the year so we were able to make almost a million dollars in interest last year oh john what did i do okay <laughs> Sorry. Um, the state funding, the state funding originally budgeted was uh, the basic ed funding you can see was a little over $20 million. However, when the governor did come out much, much later than when the original budget was pre uh, presented to you, and it, that would have been when Ms. Schaefer was still here, 
they did then give us what they called the level up funding, which was actually a little over a million dollars more in the basic ed funding. This budget that we're currently in 23, 24, we also received that level up funding. So that gave us um, almost the taxes, not the taxes, the basic education funding was 600,000 more plus the level up funding, which gave us almost $2 million more in basic education funding. But as um, our presenter said, that's not enough, is it? It's not enough. It's nice, but it's not enough. So we'll take every dollar they give us, but we we need more. The, um, the revenue then at the bottom, you can see that originally it was 37 million, a little, almost 38 million that was budgeted. We did receive 40.7 million in state funding. Therefore, our state revenue was 2.7 million over. So, we were higher in local revenue and state revenue last year. The federal revenue was, you can see in the um, one, two, the third line down, the 8750s, that is ESSER funds that were not originally budgeted for, which is not, it's not unusual when you have a huge amount of money like ESSER funds that was uh, 14.7 14 million dollars, right? So they budgeted what, what they anticipated using. However, with the opportunities that Mr. Wilson has brought to this board and to this, this community, along with everyone else in the um, teaching staff and everything else that you as a board have agreed upon, we did spend $1.2 million more. How that works is when we do these initiatives and you have grant money, then there's a quarterly report that goes to the state and they then refund you what you have spent. Therefore, that's why that adjustment of 1.292 is up there because that's the amount that we actually spent and then they did reimburse us for in the ESSER funds. We didn't spend the whole $14.7 million though. The current budget that we're sitting in with a little over 6 million, I think, yes. Um, so with that said, the only negative um, number I would tell you that it doesn't look very good is the uh, capital project fund transfer with the $3 million. You have an account that is your capital project transfer funds. It was set up years ago when you took a bond issuance and those funds were set aside to keep your bond payment at the same level. It was set up to be $3 million for the first three years and then 1.5 for the next three years because one of the bonds was paid for completely. It still made your bond payment around $6.5 million. So it, it, it levels out your bond payment. The budgeted amount of $3 million, I think, was, was entered in there by um, the previous person in, in it was a mistake. They, she put that in there, but not realizing it was four. So we were never to move $3 million over there. We were only to move the 1.5, which you can see that we did. It's These things happen. It's not a big crisis. The money is still there. The, the amount was still exactly what it was supposed to be for your debt service payment. And everything was copacetic for how it was set up years ago when you took the bond issue. So in total, the total revenues anticipated were $109 million, a little bit more than that, plus the uh, almost $1.5 million adjustment. And you can see that we actually, um, the year-to-date revenue that was received is $113.7 million, which is $3.18081 million over what you had anticipated collecting. So what I'm telling you is you had almost $2.3 million more than you had anticipated in the 22-23 school year, which is wonderful. It, it's it's going the right direction for the revenue. So um, a couple highlights, the earnings on investments were more, the education funding, the level up, the special ed were more than $2 million. The state revenue for social security and retirement were higher than budgeted, and the federal funding was about $800,000 more than budgeted, and I explained to why that happens. Um, the interfund transfer from the capital was budgeted incorrectly and overstated, um, so the total revenue collected was over budget by $3.18 million. Expenses. The first section and the second section, the 100 salaries and the 200 employee benefits, these are all your salaries and benefits for your employees. So you can see they're about 
$53 million. So that's about half of your budget goes into salaries and benefits for everybody that works here. They were under budget, the year to date expended um, for salaries and benefits by about $600,000. So it's good to be under budget in, you know, when, when these things happen. However, <laughs> let's go to uh, the 300s are purchase professional services. We were over budget by $551,000. Also over budget in the property services by $782,000. However, that is not a reason to panic. That is where the ESSER funds were spent. These are the two categories under professional services and the property services. When we buy the kids their iPads, we get um, different um, infrastructure in the buildings. We brought in all of these the special supports for the students. You can see that the instructional supports weren't as high, but the, the support services under the 2000s, they were $1.7 million higher last year than anticipated. It is from all of the programs that you bring in, everything that Mr. Wilson presents to you, everything that Ms. Uh, Dr. White and everybody else comes up here and says, hey, we have a program, we have this, we have that. Everything you send the kids for, all of that, that is that ESSER money. That's where that went. The 500s, we were $432,000 under budget in the 500s, and that is mainly because of the busing issue, because the buses didn't run every day. So we did save some money in transportation. However, we all handled a whole lot of headaches because of it. So hopefully, you know, that's, I think it's going better this year. The 600 supplies, we were over slightly in the supplies, $250,000. The property, again, $683,000. That goes into the um, bond infrastructures, the different things that you purchase that are actually capital projects in the district, like um, uh, equipment in everything, everything that the um, that Brian and Danny need, everything that the transportation department needs, anything that anybody buys that Kelly then puts on the depreciation schedule that falls into there. Also, a lot of that was purchased with ESSER funds. And the 900s, um, the end of the 800s and the 900s, that's your bond payment. Therefore, Originally, your budget was $108 million. You spent $109 million. So there was a, a million, almost a million dollars more over expenses over the budgeted expenses. However, again, that is because not all of your ESSER funds actually were budgeted. If you go back though, to see that you did spend $109 million, if you go back to the original budgeted anticipated revenue, it was 109 million. So you still would have been within budget because you budgeted and your anticipated revenue was still within the limits of what you spent. Therefore, you have a surplus. The fund balance is now $4,530,904 higher than it was the previous year. We are now sitting on a total fund balance of $14,137,859. We have unassigned fund balance that will remain of the $8 million. That is because the state tells you to keep at least 8%, which in our budget is $8 million, for unassigned fund, uh, unassigned fund balance sitting there in case you have a major situation that goes on. Something happens, um, a, a building explodes, something like something crazy, or you find that something happened like COVID and you have to go out and spend millions of dollars on whatever. They just recommend that. That's what every district does. They have their unassigned fund balance for emergencies. The assigned fund balance will be held for future salaries and capital improvements. And I don't know why it didn't go over there, but it should be lined up. Um, $5,204,217. So that is what you can, you can hold in assigned fund balance. And I know that we've had several people ask me over the several like months, how are, what are you gonna do about ESSERS? What are you gonna do when that goes away? How are you gonna pay your bills? This is how, this is a very large portion of how you're going to do it for the next couple of years. You now have $5.2 million sitting there in a signed fund balance to pay your teachers, to pay for capital improvements, 
to make sure that everything that these kids need, the programs that they need, they can still get within reason because you don't want to spend the whole 5.2 obviously in one year. We drag that out and hopefully we can use it over the next two and a half years. But there, right there, that's your SR. And then non-spendable fund balance, that 933,000, a lot of that is accounts payable that we still have to pay out. A lot of it is actually uh, Dr. Kate's money. So your library back there, um, <laughs> sitting there, non-spendable because it's her money, you know, different things that we use to sit aside for certain grants and things like that. That's why that's called non-spendable because it has to be spent on certain things. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You gotta drop the mic thing right away. Thank you, Joe. You are on register, registered speakers. I don't see no, okay. um, public comment is missing from here, um, but we are gonna do public comment right now. Um so We'll give it a, a, a few minutes for people online to know we're doing public comment now. Um, anybody in the room who would like to speak first for public comment? We have somebody online? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Zuski. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. I was concerned that there was not actual um, public comment on the agenda for anyone that was not physically in the room. Um, I would have loved to have attended in person. However, I am feeling very under the weather. Um, uh, I would like to say congratulations to Ms. Terry Lawson for winning another term um, in her uh, in Region 2. Um, and I also, uh, I, I had a comment about something that's on the agenda, which is the um, extension of the contract for Jason McKenna Consulting. Um, I find the extension of this contract to be utterly um, um, unnecessary. It's been unnecessary to pay him um, $96,000 a year for the uh, for this school year and the past school year. Um, he uh, draws a, an executive salary from Vex Robotics um, and we have purchased the curriculum from Vex Robotics and we do not need it to be serviced by someone for the, to the tune of $96,000 a year for the next three years. We have no idea what the future will hold for the curriculum of Vex Robotics in this school district. And um, it is such a wasteful expenditure of money that should be going to salaries for building substitutes or anything that will directly benefit the students. Um, I implore everyone on the school board to vote against um, extending Mr. McKenna's contract, um, certainly because it, uh, at least at the very least, to table it because it doesn't even expire until June of next year. Um, so I appreciate uh, your listening to me and thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Is there anyone else online? Okay, Ms. Watson. Hi, Natalie Watson, 1272 Britain Road. Um, <clears throat> I did not notice that Vex was on the agenda. Um, one of my three children, um, has never touched a VEX product and continues to tell me that they don't know what VEX is. Um, another one of my children has had VEX last year. Um, and then my third child, who is now at Wilkins, has had VEX um, consistently this year at Wilkins, but did not have VEX um, much at all last year at Edgewood. So I also would say if the contract's not up yet, 
let's just see how this goes. Um, it's a new program. And I think that it's still being rolled out. Obviously, we have children that have not even touched the product yet. So if this contract's not up until next summer, there really isn't a reason to give almost $100,000 to someone. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else online? Just Okay. Let's move to curriculum. Good evening, everybody. So, curriculum, we have three tabs this month. The first one is the one that I was just mentioned in public comment. We seek approval to renew our partnership with Jason McKenna Consulting LLC for on-site coaching and professional development regarding Vex Robotics for a period of three additional years. So uh, the contract actually ends in December. So this is why we need to renew it now. And we initially signed a contract, a one-year contract uh, with Mr. McKenna's company. And I do want to emphasize that it's not with one individual. It's with Jason McKenna Consulting and all of his team that comes with that so that we could establish our kindergarten through sixth grade scope and sequence, our training and our uh, co-teaching. And those of you that, that know any of our educators know that Audra from VEX came in and did some co-teaching. Uh, Jason and Audra taught Tina. Several people from his team did professional development for our educators. And we now want to expand and need to expand our seven through 12th grade program. So at the high school right now, we have uh, EXP and V5 robots. We purchased the robots, right? Which is exactly what uh, Mr. Zuski was talking about. But we don't have any training on those robots. We definitely haven't had any co-teaching on those robots. And those are the robots that are going to be used in automatronics. So our goal is over the next three years to create a program in which our scholars, as they graduate, can graduate with a certificate that will be an automatronic certificate that would allow them to go to a place like EOS and work here in the community for one of our largest employers straight out of high school, if they so choose, using computer science and robotics. Um, Mr. McKenna is also, and his team are also gonna be uh, vital in applying for some of those grants. We actually uh, talked to uh, one of the RK Mellon program officers who asked us to apply for $250,000 grant in this next year, uh, but she needs the details around high school certification, automatronics, and what we're going to do to ensure that our scholars are career ready. And so Mr. McKenna's team will help us with that. Uh, the proposal that he mentions is also uh, working with Robert Morris to bring in a college and high school robotics program. They have a separate factory direct robotic arm, which for anybody that has seen factories recently, there's like one individual, 20, 20 robots on the floor. So this would train our scholars through Robert Morris's program on how to use robotics through that VEX program uh, and the, the platform that they have. And then uh, just really revamping our workforce development. We talked a lot about workforce development and what that looks like while still offering the same level of support for Ms. Dietrich, Mr. Bothwell, and the rest of our STEAM and innovation team within classrooms and with our, our principals. I feel like this is crucial. I feel like when I came on board in November of 2019, I said, as long as Eddie Wilson is here, NWEA MAP will be here. And, and I know that Ms. Rizuski talked about, well, I don't know what the future is gonna hold in her comment, but as long as Eddie Wilson's here, Vex Robotics is gonna be here. And so, I am committed to making sure that our educators are prepared to use this platform to, to get our kids ready for their college and career choices in life and going back to that mission and vision that they're able to then choose what their opportunities are. So I think it's a very important tab. I think it's very important to extend the contract. Um, and uh, Mr. Belmont asked the question, actually, the, the number that's mentioned in there, that is the contract. So there's not like a separate contract and consulting fee. That's all lumped in together with the, the whole organization um and and then we don't even mention i haven't mentioned yet that we we've just started a competitive team at the middle school 
Mr. McKenna's team is going to help us start a competitive team at the high school. So these are these are groups that will then go and compete against the rest of the world. Uh, and we're going to host uh, events. And that's something that uh, I don't know anything about. Ms. Dietrich is trying to learn all about hosting events. Um, but that the, the folks that have worked at VEX know all about hosting robotics competitions. And so we're going to we're going to become the robotics and computer science hub in the area. I think it's important that we have this consultancy to in order to do that. Otherwise, we've got a whole bunch of robots sitting around in boxes, but nobody knows how to use them. So I have a uh, question. Here. Yes, sir. Could you speak to, for, for those of us not in the tech area, yes, sir. could you speak to who Jason McKenna is, what he means to kind of the, this area that we're looking yeah. at, and why it's in, in valuable that he's here? Yeah. Right? Why it's just not some other person or, you know, what is the point of him being here? All great questions, sir. I, I, uh, I don't want to ramble, so I'll try to be succinct. Jason McKenna is the VEX representative who we worked with when we started saying that we wanted to have computer science and robotics K-12 in the district. And we looked around, we looked at Spiro, we looked at Bbots, we looked at all the different platforms that are, that are built on computer science and robotics. And there was no platform outside of VEX that had a K-12 vertical alignment for both computer science and robotics. And so we partnered with Mr. McKenna from VEX to implement this program in our district. We purchased VEX robots for our district. We purchased the um, PD Plus platform, licenses of PD Plus platform so that our educators could have that collaborative environment. And then Mr. McKenna's consulting group is the group that comes in and trains Ms. Dietrich, our director of STEAM and innovation, offers all of the PD. When I when I when we purchase books from McGraw Hill, then we get a, a quote for here's how much the books are going to cost, here's how much the PD is going to be, and they're two separate quotes. And usually the PD is a hell of a lot more expensive. Sorry for the language than the books are, um, because the books are worthless without without the PD. This is the same thing. We purchased a whole bunch of robots that we know are going to be critical for our, our educators and for our scholars. And we need somebody that's working with our educators that knows all about that. And Mr. McKenna has been with VEX since the beginning um, and is the best person to, to have his team come in and, and train us. Yes, ma'am. I ma just wanted to comment. Um, Mike Branson attends Edgewood. And the reason why he goes to Edgewood is because of the robotics. Uh, there was a pamphlet that was sent home with him. And it was sitting on the table where his arts and crafts are. He immediately recognized the activity of robotics that he participated in in kindergarten. So it is a valuable tool. So thank you. It makes me feel good, Ms. Lyons. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I talk about my kids all the time. I got a fifth grader and an eighth grader. Both of them love VEX, and my fifth grader asked for VEX robots for Christmas. So mm -hmm. I, it's it's a big deal. I have a I, question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned that her child never touched a robot. Is there a reason why a classroom or a group of children would not touch the robots, or are they made available to all students? They're av made available to all students. As a matter of fact, the high school, Mr. McGuire, has a lending library that's available to anybody that wants to use the robots outside of the school day. But every scholar, kindergarten through fifth grade, has a 40-minute block that is the VEX block. We built it into the schedule. And then in sixth through eighth grade, we have an elective, an after-school program, and the mathematics teachers all teach VEX in the sixth grade. And then seventh through twelfth, it's offered as an elective across the board. So there's no reason for any scholar to have not touched a robot. I, I can't speak to the, the comment. Um, but I know that every scholar that I've spoken to that's in our buildings has has worked with VEX and has VEX daily. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, he stated that the contract ends December. Are you sure about that? I, the sequence of payments I've seen, the last payment may be in December, stretching it out, stretching activities out to mm -hmm. in the it end in June. Got, I, I don't know what the, the last contract is, but I, I know that we need Mr. McKenna's consulting organization for three years past the school year in order to get to a certification. On you on that, that, you stated that it ends in December, and that's why you're going to get it done this week, this month. Yes, sir. And I'm saying 
is it does it really end in December or is it just the last payment comes in December? That's a great question. I have to go back in my notes. I don't know that answer. So Mr. Wilson and I both, um, when we started working uh, with VEX uh, and working with Mr. McKenna, Mr. McKenna is the reason we got invited to Dallas, uh, Ms. Dietrich and Mr. Wilson and I to be presenters. At that meeting, he introduced us to Bernell Murray, who sat on that panel. Um, he coordinated us with him. Mr. Murray then attended our session that Mr. McKenna got us lined up with to present. We presented, he met with us afterwards and committed to us there that he was gonna grow CS for all to Pittsburgh because of Woodland Hills. Mm -hmm. And we were then the seventh city that they were gonna grow CS for all uh, program to, committed funding for that. Um, and then, which is how we then were invited to Oakland, California, which we met Ms. Malloy, who um, has huge pockets in the tech world. Um, and again, what they're proud of is we built the program that they attempt to build. So they don't like funding programs with a promise of a pilot and then school boards change, administrators change, it goes away. They're like, you're already doing it. So latch on to us and we want to take you around and show the program you're doing. And you're an example of what a computer science for all school needs. It's about bringing computer science to students who typically are underrepresented in these fields. And so school districts like ours typically don't have programs for everyone. They do it in gifted, but they do it as a special, right? And so he built all this, this is point blank. Um, and now we want to grow it and keep it going because uh, he built the connections. And now we have the funding finally coming to us. It's paying for this all. I just did a quick search uh, on our website. <laughs> and the last contract we have with Jason McKenna is from December of 2022. Which would kind of imply a year. Be December of 2023. That's yeah. right. That was in our uh, December 5th legislative meeting. So, other no questions? questions? Uh, would you repeat yes. that, please? Pardon? Could you repeat that, what you just stated? Um, I did a search on our board docs, which you can do, and put McKenna in, and the it shows a contract uh, uh, under, I don't know what item it was, um, for Jason McKenna for December of 2020, 20, sorry, 2022, that would be a year ago that we did a contract with him. So, and I'm just being general here, but it would stand to reason that the year is up. So the contract was for only a year? That's correct. That much I know. Mm -hmm. Harry, did you have a question? Yeah, it just basically says December 22. It didn't show much. I was going to just, I don't really, I guess, have a question. More of a statement. The EOS Woodland Hills Educate and Partnership Initiative. Can you elaborate on that, Eddie? Absolutely. So uh, as as Dr. Castagna mentioned, that we're still kind of in the nascent stages there. But EOS, who we believe is going to be one of the, the major uh, employers in the area, wants to partner with us because of our robotics program so that they can recruit employees straight from our district to go work at EOS. So we want to keep our kids in our community with high paying jobs working on robotics. Uh, it, for me, it feels like a win, win, win for all, all families, but that's what the, the partnership is. Um, and we've met with the director from EOS his name is Chad, and I forget his last name, which is a, a bad thing on my part. Um, but he he very much wants to work with us to create a, a pipeline of scholars. Any of our scholars that want to go work at EOS have the opportunity to get the robotics expertise here that they would need to go work at EOS. So thank you for um, elaborating. I just yep. wanted I read it. I comprehend. I yep. just wanted to hear it from you. Absolutely. So the conversation is Mr. McKenna is going to build a scope and sequence. So students can receive in our high school factory automation certification. Mm -hmm. So then when they, if they decide to go on a half day work program, they can leave our high school with this factory automation and go straight for ELS yes. and work on their factory floor, which looks like a different factory floor in the old days, because mm -hmm. now you have robots you're controlling mm -hmm. and so on. So our students will have to be the only school round with that pathway. And these are real career jobs right. with potential right. for growth and potential to move into management and other things like that. So. Yeah, um, and that's how I looked at that. I really, I really like that uh, partnership. 
Yeah. And that's actually, so Paul Schoenfeld that I mentioned from University of Minnesota, they're right now, they're working on a digital badging that could be attached to high school transcripts that would be an automatronics certification. Um, I just like the word automatronics, Automatronic. but it's, it's this certification <laughs> that's accepted then across the state at either a university, if a scholar chooses to go to a university or these employers where they can go in with their automatronic certification and, and be qualified to, to oversee robots and computer programming. Nice. It's a big deal. Thank you, Eddie. Yes, ma'am. All those jobs for the future. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Pittsburgh has become okay. such a tech hub. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Well, things are changing, yeah. changing over from manual to tech. That's right. Yes, so ma'am. It's important. That's why the president's wife was here today. That's she right. She was in Lawrenceville. Mm -hmm. um, expecting some new robotic uh, industries that are being built down there. And right. so we have to be on top of this and not stand by mm -hmm. and watch other areas grow. That's right. So not every student is ready to go to maybe a four-year college. This right. is a great way to expand a job opportunities to those type of children mm -hmm. or adults. Adults, I should that's say, right. I graduated from high school. This is a great opportunity. I agree. I agree. This is, I just have a comment. We don't have, this is not something we need to talk about now, but it would be great to to um, understand how interaction with robotics at these levels um, affects uh, students from an academic perspective. So kind of how, <laughs> what concepts, things along those lines does yeah. that interaction foster, right? So, which, which then, you know, points to the value of it, right? I, I, it's kind of, it's it like makes sense. The classes it has to exactly. add to your That's understanding. Right. We know that it does. It would yes. just be at some point well, to even, sure. even go more. Specific. We made a co-curricular and an extracurricular, so our teachers have us embedded in the curriculum. All of our right. teachers now are robotics teachers, and I think that's important. It's a mind shift change that a lot of schools have trouble taking on because I don't know anything about robotics. I'm I'm a math teacher, right? Um, but they really they've, they've done a great job, and it's only because of the supports and Tina too. I mean Tina. Tina invited me to her classroom, uh, was the first teacher to invite me and say, I'm trying to figure this out. L listen to what I'm trying to do here. She really got her hands in it. And um, and now she's the model that our other teachers are following. So yep. you have to shout out Tina in the back. Tina. We That's talked a lot about it. We can't forget you, girl. For um, sure. And I, just to that point, so I, as I had tons of research that I'm happy to share. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, the number one thing when Dr. Castagna said, I want us to to have computer science programming across the board. The number one thing that sold me is that there was a, an article in Forbes magazine a couple of years ago from the 500 top CEOs in America. And they were asked, what is the number one skill that you think you have and that you think your top employers have? And they said the ability to problem solve. And computer science is all problem solving. It's all thinking through a problem and figuring out where the block goes in the computer science so that you know if then this happens and it makes the robot go where it's supposed to go. From day one, it's all problem solving. And so I, that that's what sold me, regardless of what other things it does. If our kids come away from Woodland Hills, not just knowing the dates from history, not just knowing what an energy is, but also then knowing how to solve real world problems, then we've done our job. Any other questions? At the end. Any, any other questions? Okay. 3.2, we seek approval to enter into a contract with leveled up leadership to perform a current state analysis of the instructional strengths and effectiveness of school leaders and executive leaders in the district. So this is this is a, a small consulting contract, but this is leveled up leaders is an educational consulting firm that will come in and interview me, the rest of the executive team, the principals, and identify strengths, areas of effectiveness, and also areas of growth, so that as we train each other, and as we build, right, one of my favorite sayings is help is not on the way, as we build the solutions, we can know where our strengths are, where our areas of weakness are, and they'll come in and, and give us some recommendations for how to continue to grow our team to be the most effective team that it can be. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity. I think that most districts don't really think about that kind of training. Yes, sir. Oh, yep. Is this an updated to the one that was pre This is, yeah. The, the one before was a, a previous proposal that was actually for about four times more. 
Um, and I told them that I wasn't willing to, to go that far yet. Um, so this is for, uh, for the, just the, the 10,000 for the, for the work that they're going to do for a, a current state analysis. Yep. It also has my title corrected. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I was concerned about. I didn't, it really yep. got us Understand well, my, both my title and my last name confuse a whole lot of people, but we're going to get there. Yes, sir. Um, I, this is something I, I will never let go. The presentation we had was given in an executive session last year by an administrator in a different building. Um, the concerns that were brought out will this um, we, we can't leadership, what, what are you about to go to? Will this leadership address those concerns, no. those issues? I, this leadership program? I, since I'm not an executive, I'm not sure, sir, but I I know that it will it will address the the many of the needs that we have around planning for training and professional development for our, our school leaders. I don't I wasn't an executive. I'm I'm not so it's privy to that really affect the curriculum, it just deals with leadership. That's right. Is there a self-assessment part of this? There is, yes, sir. So there there will be surveys and then uh the consulting firm will go through artifacts that I provide uh and then do those interviews that I talked about. Uh and then there'll be kind of a uh planning and action planning stage for, for all of us. Yes, sir. Good question. Is there a follow-up? So there can be a follow-up. So there will definitely be a follow-up to the to the initial current state analysis mm -hmm. with recommendations, right. areas where they recommend moving forward. If we wanted to continue with them to do some additional training and things, there could be further follow-up. Okay. We got to see how the current state analysis goes before we okay. before we talk about any of that. I want, I'm trying to gain some clarity when you talk about leadership. Um, would they be giving assessments on how to improve the leadership or what leadership is doing wrong? Not what leadership is doing wrong, where, where we have strengths. So I'll give an example, right? So Mr. Kress is sitting back there. Mr. Kress has an experience with Esports and computer science. It's something I would have never known had I not been in his interview, but I know it because I've been in his interview. And so when we talk about building out a robotics program in middle school and high school, other than Mr. Greenwich, I don't know of any of our administrators that have experience with computer science or esports, but we're trying to build out both of those programs. And so an example of a finding from this consultancy might be you're underutilizing Mr. Cress's expertise when you have your leadership retreat over the summer and you have breakout sessions for how to do SAP team, MTSS, PBIS, you might want to include Mr. Cress on how to build out a computer science and esports uh, program within the building. So that would be just an example that I could come up with. This, this organization is, has decades of experience doing this, but they'll analyze all of the data and information that they can get to find out where we're strong as leaders and where we could use improvement, how we can do that together as a team and where we might have some gaps that we need to go find additional resources for. How long would that take? So the proposal is for six to eight weeks. Makes sense. Yes, sir. The last one that I have is actually, uh, it, it's not even my wording. It's Ms. Albright's wording, but we need good approval so she can go out and start recruiting kids. Ms. Albright, Madam Albright, as she likes to be called, our French teacher at the high school, she wants to take a group of students to Paris in summer of 2025. It's a year and a half away. It will be fully funded by the students. They'll do fundraising. They'll, I'm sure, chip in some on their own. Uh, this would be at no cost to the district, but it requires board approval for her to go to uh to the, the organization to begin planning for the trip and to begin recruiting kids. So we're asking the board to approve the pre-stages pre of a trip so that she can go out and start recruiting kids. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you, so Thank you Eddie. Mm -hmm.
special education. So <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, we seek approval to enter into a contract with Leader Services to provide licenses for the IEP Writer platform. Any questions with that? Um, I'm also going to speak under people personnel since Dr. White isn't, isn't here. Uh, we seek permission to accept the draft agreement between UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Telehealth Pilot Program and the Woodland Hills School District. Any questions? Thank you. Sir. Personnel, Ms. Boyd. <laughs> Good evening. We're going to discuss personnel 6.1, Section A, authorization for leaves, Section B, authorization for retirement and resignations, Section D, authorization to hire non professional staff, Section F, authorization for EDR mentor actions, and Section, section G, authorization for miscellaneous. If there are questions, we would have to adjourn to an executive session. Are there questions? Thank you. Thank you. Technology, Mr. Kim. Good evening. I'd like to start with a special thank you to all the veterans, uh, not only out there, but in our district. I got to attend the Turtle Creek ceremony today, and the kids did a wonderful job down there. Uh, so my part, I would like to seek approval to advertise an RFP for district-wide network switches through the PEPA mini bid process for E-rate fiscal year 24-25. There is no cost to the district. And what the E-rate program is, it's a federal program where whatever amount we spend, the federal government pays 85%. We only pay 15%. So if we replace our switches just for a round number, they cost 100000 The district only has to pay 15000 and the federal government covers the rest. Any questions? I don't have a question, Mr. <laughs> Kim, but thank you for your service to our country. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Johnson building. Hello. Another slow month. Uh 10.1. We seek approval for November November facility usage. Any questions? Thank you. Easy. Look at this one. Uh, library, Dr. King. We seek approval for the contract for Ken Schultz of San Shannon Construction to be general contractor for the renovation of the Swissville Library. Fees to be paid by the library. The contract and general conditions document is attached to this the agenda and approval is requested to happen tonight. And Mr. Schultz is here. Are there any questions? You need approval tonight? Mm -hmm. I'd re I'm requesting approval tonight, yes. For 12.1? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Get a motion. So can I, can I get a motion then? Um, after give us a second. Okay. Do we want to hear him first? What's that? Do you want to hear him first? I mean, there's a lot of work. Hang on. All right. Okay. So should I talk? Should I move? <laughs> second. Okay. Now we discuss. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ms. Call, can you call that? Or do we have any, any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Questions first. I do have a question because this all says draft. Is this going to change? Uh, it'll be um, some of the details will continue to be worked out as the work gets done with the architects and the contract and the general contractor. But the payment won't well, that's solid, right? This is going to be a lab libraries covering this, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jake. You're welcome, Terry. Ready? 
Mr. Beaumont? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Flanagan Bay? Yes. Dr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Renslin? Yes. Ms. Creech? Or oh, I apologize. Mrs. Lyons? Yes. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mrs. Orthrell? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Um, item 12.2, the board seeks acceptance of Swissvale Library's internet safety policy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Tate. Yeah, under legal matters, Mr. Rakunas asked uh, for a vote this evening. This is the resolution over the previously discussed and presented Edgewood property, the small piece of land behind the playground and the road. This is a resolution basically saying it's unused, unnecessary for the school district, and that we have no intention of ever using that piece of land, and that will help initiate what you know, they need to fill with the, file with the county for the sale. So can I get a motion and a second to approve this resolution? So moved. Second. Any questions? Ms. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Flanagan Bay? Yes. Dr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Renslin? Yes. Ms. Lyons? Yes. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mrs. Arthrell? Yes. Mr. Belmont? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. School finance. Um, 14.1 is the ratification of the bill list for the invoices paid after the October 18th legislative meeting. 14.2 is the approval for the November bill list. 14.3 is the acceptance of the October uh, fund reports and the student activity reports. And 14.4 is the approval of the investment report. Any questions? Any questions? So, under superintendent's report, I will be asking for three motions of approval for next week. Uh, the first is the approval to ratify the ESP incentive plan uh, with our support staff that would go back to the effective date of 11-1. The second was the approval for the trip for 412 Justice uh, for the two charter buses. I misspoke earlier. I thought we approved this last month, but I'm asking for approval uh, this month for that trip. Uh, and the last, a motion and a second for Mr. Wilson and I to attend the Future of Education Technology Conference in Orlando. They asked us to speak at this conference, again, about our Computer Science Significant Initiative. We want to keep building that Woodland Hills brand. It's pretty cool that uh, to hear Woodland Hills name with these national uh, conferences across the United States. So any questions on 15.1 through 15.3? It's going to be really tough to go to Florida in January. Yeah, terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> terrible. Staying. We would have went north if it was north. We promise. <laughs> uh, is Mr. Ford here? No. Okay, so um, for the Rankin Community Center, Mr. Ford asked for this motion to be on the agenda. He wants to treat it as a district event will be which would be in conjunction with the Rankin Christian Center and others and not so much just a Rankin Community Center event so he wants to have a collaboration district wide and which his proposal was attached there um Kellington Security actually contacted us today they're going to donate 50 turkeys to be passed out to families nice. and so nice. um it's going to be a pretty pretty nice event for us here administrators and board members our NHS induction ceremony is going on at the high school that evening at six o'clock. It's just a busy time of year, but um, I told Mr. Ford that we will do what we have to do and then head over there after. So um, we will be asking for that approval next week. So any questions about that? Thank you. Okay. Um, old business, any old business? New business, new business. I have something. Um, in light of what I uh, just heard from Mr. Wilson um, concerning, he wasn't privy to what was spoken at that presentation. And, and I'm really surprised to hear that he wasn't um, 
updated about that presentation because it's centered around curriculum and it was so insightful about what is wrong. Can we, I mean, I think I we started to, the conversation to... saying there was an executive session discussion and Mr. Wilson just said, I'm not in executive session, so I don't right. really know about so, this. So I'm so, saying, Say. Why wasn't he brought abreast of what was said in there? I'm not talking about no details in that session. So uh, yes. it centered around curriculum, and it showed that there were holes in the curriculum, yes, in that, especially in that particular building. So yeah, him yeah. being the curriculum yes. director, why wasn't he brought in on and updated on what was discovered? And to this date, I don't know if anything has been done to repair what was shown to us in that presentation. So I think now that we, well, I would rather not, I would, I would rather not talk about that, but what we can do is you, you made that point. So we could either have that conversation in executive, um, you know, and ask all the questions and talk about it in more detail at that point, we can we'll invite uh, Mr. Wilson to come in and do that. And then we can even have conversations at any point after this um, to discuss it further. Any other new business? Okay. Public comment, anybody in the room? I think there was a question there. I think there was a question about, about yes. Um, I think there was a lot of staying I kind of like it. Um, so my question is, if there's a certificate or credit that's going to be given to the students that, um, let's say, um, have their credits and they're looking for something else, but if they're going to get a credit or certificate, is EOS going to promise them jobs? Because what if at that time these jobs are filled and they get this credit or certificate and then they can't do it? That's a, that's a great question, Don. And part of EOS's presentation and part of their funding is that their factory floor has to look like the community population in which they exist. Okay, no, I understand that. and it has to be diverse. And but they have to commit to some type of pathway for the local school district. So part of that, when they do their presentation in December, um, I think you should attend. They're going to speak to those statistics of how they're going. Have they have to lock in certain jobs for our students? Okay. Yeah, it it really it'd be beneficial for you to attend that in December. Apologies, what's your name? Tom. Tom. What area are you talking about? Anyone else in the room? Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It is. <laughs>